My family immigrated from Soviet Russia, which is, you know, just one of the places on earth which you really want to get out of. And they were able to make it out and come to the States. And my father was this awakened spiritual teacher. And so I had like this very early grounding in this kind of perspective on reality. But I don't think that's accidental. I just feel like we all come to it when we're supposed to. And um, but then my life became very tragic, I, you know, because you've read the book, yeah. but everybody started to die. My mom died when I was six and my father wasn't really like <clears throat> he didn't have his feet on the ground. He was more like a space cadet. He was really, really out there and, and very much like the real deal when it came to spiritual teachings. But he just wasn't like of the world. He didn't care about money or prestige or you know, anything like that. So our house just fell apart and at a death after death, funeral after funeral. And we were just very poor, but very rich at heart. Like we had, you know, love, but we didn't have any stability or safety or security. And I got signed to Sony when I was really young. I made music. I played in New York clubs and oh, wow. that, yeah. And that led to like so much success and then led to me becoming a big DJ in the art scene in New York city and really sex, drugs and rock and roll inside of all of that. And my life just got darker and darker. And inside of that, I had a baby. I had like a series of events. I think they were all leading to me having this kind of awakening for anyone who's watching or listening, who is having difficult times, just try and remember that difficult times are like a rub and I feel like I was being rubbed and rubbed and rubbed. And so the way that it looked in my life was within a series of two years, I lost my first daughter to sudden infant death syndrome. I had a near death experience out of nowhere and my best friend hung himself. There was just tragedy after tragedy and my father died out of nowhere, I had a heart attack. And I think that that led to kind of a moment where it was a reckoning, like I was either going to go to death or maybe into into worse places in hell mm -hmm. or I was going to get sober and that was almost 13 years ago and I got sober and that sober journey led me back to my father's work and I devoted my life to my father's work but then really started a daily practice where I devoted my life to prayer and meditation and everything started to change. And I was gifted this idea that I was meant to be a spiritual teacher. And I was meant to create meditation experiences in art galleries and museums and score them with my own music. And, try and that's what I did. And it just kind of took off like a wildfire. I became very successful very quickly. And, you know, that they, they say that overnight success, it's like, there's no such thing as an overnight success, but it felt very shocking. Like I went from being very poor to having this very thriving business and becoming a well-known spiritual teacher all over the globe. I just want to kind of backtrack in your, you know, having this uh, dad who's now a single dad uh, raising yeah. you as a six-year-old and you're saying that you then had a, a poor upbringing monetary wise, but then oh, yeah. you, had, you, you had all this other sort of heart field experiences at what age then do you get the sony deal do you and, and and how do you get to get to that point of getting the sony deal from a sort of poor background well it doesn't take money to get a sony deal especially right. in the 90s where there was like a lot of money in the music industry but i was like playing clubs from the age of 16 cbgb's um baby jupiter like all the cool clubs in new york and um, I got discovered and I think it was I was 18 when I got signed to Sony and they put a lot of money into it and I was like, driven around in limos and like did all these fancy shows but it just kind of went nowhere in the end because right. I think my alcoholism was kind of brewing anyway and so I managed to destroy all of that with my alcoholism and that is what I would say now back then I would have told you I was just like better than everyone else or something <laughs> right so what's what's in this point you're 18 you have limos around and it's a totally different childhood from your uh totally different life from your childhood what's your dad saying doing at this point oh he was just super proud he never doubted that I was gonna be a huge success like he of was course. a big fan of mine yeah but I think he wasn't you know, he was very much in pain from losing his wife, my mom of, you know, they were together for 23 years and then she just died very suddenly. Mm -hmm. And I think um, he wanted to make things better for me and he just took care of me the best that he could. 
And I, that what that meant was we just focused on enlightenment. And I just didn't learn how to function in reality until I was much older. So you're in this scene for the, the you called it the sex, drugs and rock and roll. How long are you in this scene for? About a decade. I think it was from 20. I got sober at 29. And in this moment, do you, are you are you going back to your, because to, there must have been moments where you, because uh, the addictive cycle is very, um, you, you have that moment where you come back to yourself a little bit and then there's yeah. the weakness and falling back into it. In those moments where you're going back to your meditation practices from the word go or were you just sort of doing your I never I never went back and forth on drugs I was just a full-on like I was so committed to drugs and I loved drugs and I thought they were wonderful and I was a big fan I believed I'm an artist and so to me I was like I'm an artist I'm in a lot of pain and this works for me and the truth is is that drugs and alcohol are just a solution they're not really a problem they're just a crappy solution but they're a solution mm-hmm. and so I had a solution and it was heroin and cocaine and mushrooms and LSD and I loved all those things because they let me peer into the window of my subconscious and peer into the window of bliss without doing any work and I'm very lazy by nature so I was like I'm going to skip the work and I'm just going to get the fun results So um, I meditated through inside of it. I remember one night I had a girlfriend over my house. She was with her boyfriend. They were doing crack in the living room and I was doing heroin, which I thought was so evolved as opposed to crack, like as if my heroin use was more elevated than their crack use. I mean, that was literally where I had gone. And I remember I was like, I'm going to go to the bedroom and meditate. You know, it was like I went to the bedroom like I was better than them. And I meditated, which really was like me meditating and then falling asleep for like nine hours because I was on heroin. Right. And then I woke up and I remember coming to the living room and finding them in this huge brawl. They were just having like this huge fight because they'd run out of crack. You know, that was basically my life just looked like this insane mesh. So then you're this successful um, music artist still performing and um, then there's, there's again like you said a, a list of tragic events and I think your, your father passing away losing your daughter and I think your house burned down oh yes my house burned down yeah I forgot about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I mean three pretty major life events and at this point you're towards your 20 the end of your 20s yep I was in the mid middle, like I, when all of those things happened, I think I was 26 when she died. Right. And then 27, 28, it just all happened in that year. My dad died when I was 28. So 26 to 28, it all happened in those two years. And that's a lot of pain to deal with. And this yeah. time you think I'm not going to go to the drugs. Uh, I need something else. You know, it was a lot of tragedy and I was so righteous and so like, I loved heroin and I I thought I was doing something right, but somehow the signs were being shown to me. And I remember I was seeing a spiritual teacher at the time. She was like um, a healer of some kind. And my father's fan club, he had a huge fan club of people, his lives he had saved, gathered money together for me to go see a healer because they knew how much pain I was in and they knew that I was on drugs. And I saw her and she said something like, so where do you see your life in 10 years? You know? And I just remember being like, I don't know, like, you know, married with kids with a great career. And she was like, Oh great. How do you plan on getting to that point? And I was like, what do you mean? Like if I do heroin every day, I'm not going to end up there. (laughs) And it just kind of was doing the math. Yeah. And it dawned on me that in 10 years, if I didn't stop doing heroin and cocaine every day, I was really going to be pretty much in the same place at the age of 40, but I was going to be older. Like nothing right. was going to change. And I, I couldn't take it anymore. Like the amount of effort, it takes a lot of effort to get heroin when you don't have a lot of money. You have to manipulate people and you have to like go to parties and schmooze with, you know, you have to do all kinds of things. And I just remember being out of energy like I was like I can't manipulate one more person into getting me drugs right I'm just done and I remember hearing from someone that they had gotten sober that I knew I used to drink with so I was like hey are you sober like can you show me what you did and she was like sure and she was still sober at the time and so that was it that was the last time I didn't I did drink again I tried to get sober there was like a few mishaps like once I did like 
uh, ecstasy 30 days later or something. And I was like, oh my God, like, this is dumb. You know, like I just finally saw that sobriety was this really incredible ride. I, I never knew because I was always drinking from the age of 20. I didn't know that sobriety could be so expansive and so multifaceted. Right. So was it, was it a one, one success story? Was it, right, this is my moment. I'm quitting this. I'm, I'm, I'm done. And that was it. And you've never looked back. Never. That's quite big. And that's a big decision. And, and my question is, how do you, how does someone do that? Because I know a lot of people trying to quit things that they know is not helpful for them, but it's a cycle that people repeat and just get back to, Mm. to, to it. So how, how, how did you manage to get out of a 10 year behavior with one decision? Yeah. One decision and two, like 48 hours of heroin withdrawal, but yeah, like one decision, one for me, it's, I turned my life over to the unknown. Like I began to pray and meditate. And I think the answer for me was in, prayer and meditation. And also I was using a tool that's in my book called divided attention, where I was able to float above myself and just see myself from above. And I kept seeing myself and I was like, is this really who you believe the universe or God, whatever that thing is that flows through all of us? Do you think that that's what that energy wants for you? And I could see myself and I was like, you're a total loser. You know, like as much as like I had had this history with DJing and and music, like I wasn't really that successful in in any of that. Like the Sony stuff fell apart and then the DJing stuff was like neither here nor there. It was me just kind of hanging on by a thread because I'm very, you know, I hate to say it like sounding very boastful, but I'm very brilliant and I'm interesting and I'm pretty. So I can, I can get by on a bunch of bullshit, you know, and it was just like a whole lot of bullshit and just like this you know, when you have someone, especially with alcoholism, which is something I believe that I, I have and I'm very proud of, to me, like being a real drug addict and a real alcoholic means you're someone who's really capable. Because if you're that capable of lying to yourself, just think who you'd be if you stopped lying to yourself. Who Think about what truths you could tell. Because truth and lies are, are the same. They're two sides of one coin. So if you're a good liar, just think about what a great truth teller you would be. And so the, the, it was a swap out. Like I was like, I think I want to try to see what the light, you know, what the light has to offer. And I could tell that it was going to require more effort on my part. But the weird thing is, is that effort looks one way, but it isn't what you think it's going to be. Like it looks so hard until you do it. And then when you do it, it's easier it's easier not to drink. It's easier not to drink coffee. It's easier not to sleep with bad guys that I don't like. It's easier not to harm myself and, and you know, gossip about my friends. It's easier to not compete with my female friends. My life is so much easier today because I don't do any of these things. But I, you don't know until you, you, you look so hard, like how will I stop doing heroin when it makes me feel relaxed and at ease? Well, just fucking try it and then see, you know, see what's on the other side.